Hey everybody, it's the night before I release episode 016. I'm just down here, just started raining, and uh, thinking about everything that guy's been through. And um, on the last episode, I asked you guys to please like, comment, and subscribe to the channel, turn the notification bell to all because I was having a problem reaching my audience and you did that and it worked. And I just wanna say thank you for doing that. That means the world to me. I love you guys. Please do it again. All right, enjoy the show. One last thing guys, that's not just for my channel. Like, comment, subscribe to every channel that you watch. Helps more than you know. All right. Love you guys. Let's move into December 17th, 2018. When you save that little girl. Yeah. Tonight, the baby's father is charged with domestic assault. Police say they didn't know about the child until the father walked in saying he drowned his six-month-old. I want you to be very descriptive. I want you to talk about every little detail that you saw, that you felt, what you were feeling, what your mindset was, all that kind of stuff. It looked like the soul was gone. There was no soul behind his eyes, and that's exactly how he looked when I ran past him going down the hall to go to that call. Um, it's just a different kind of evil. The child's father, Jonathan Ziccarelli, said he planned to kill his daughter for over 24 hours. He said he came down here to this pond, got out of his car, walked down here at least three different times trying to determine if he could kill his child right before he put her in the water and watched her sing. So you get out of the car, you're running down to the pond. Yeah. And the first thing you see is a six month old baby girl yeah. face down in a pond yeah. who was murdered yeah. by her father. You can see the back of her head. Uh, that's an image that's still there. Uh, little curls on her hair. Police say it took them around five to six minutes from the time the father confessed to when they pulled the six-month-old out of the pond here off Doc Henry, just south of Cherokee. Chief Halgrenson said she wasn't moving, that she looked like a little porcelain doll just floating on the surface. The next memory that I've got is, is me being uh, basically uh, punched, kicked, choked, uh, yelled at, screamed at by my lieutenant and other officers trying to get me off the guy. Um, I, I hope at some point, um, you know, eight or nine years down the road, I'll get to meet her. I would, I would love that. I hope you get to meet her too. Welcome back to the Sean Ryan Show. This episode, 016, is exactly why I do what I do here at Vigilance Elite. He's a local hero, and he's in desperate need of all of our support. I want to start off, as always, by saying thank you to Patreon and all the patrons for the support that you've given me and Vigilance Elite to produce these shows. These stories would never be heard if it wasn't for you guys. If you haven't left us a review on iTunes, please go down to the description, hit the link, and leave us a review on iTunes. Leave us one word, that's all we need. We really appreciate it, thank you. The gentleman who's our next guest found us from a social anxiety video I posted several years ago. You can read that email, it's attached along with all of his awards that he's received throughout his career and his support page and his email address. He's a local hero who saved a six month old baby from being murdered by her father. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please welcome Chief Greg Hal Grimson to the Sean Ryan Show. Thank you. 
Chief Hal Grimson. Welcome to the show, man. Thank you. I've been trying to get you out here forever, but uh, we had some court stuff we had to wait to settle down for to get you out here to get your story in. Yeah. And uh, just so just to kick it off, I want to start it um, by telling the audience a little bit about you. So basically, you saved a six month old baby girl from being drowned by her father right. in a pond and then got a little rough with her father who tried to kill his daughter and you're stripped of your badge, your gun, you're a chief of police at the time. Yeah. Basically, I don't know if it's the city, the county or the department, uh, basically tossed you out on your ass with, with no support. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, that's the end of your law enforcement career, long law enforcement career. So me and you've talked a couple times and uh, I tried to get you on the show. Finally, I've got you here. The last conversation we had, the last text conversation we had was you were saying, I just want to be a protector. I've always been this. That's all I want to do. That's what I'm good at. Now you're selling. No, you're not selling. You're working in the service department at a car dealership in Oklahoma. Right. So I said, why don't you come on the show? I don't know how many people are going to watch it. I can never, you know, I can't control that. Uh, usually we have a really good viewership. So if anybody watching is looking to hire a former police chief hero, somebody like yourself, your email address, Greg's email address is in the description and uh, you can reach out to him there or if you just want to support. So moving on, before that day, um, everybody that comes on the show gets a little, a little something. <laughs> Most people, anyways. Most. <laughs> but uh, there you go. Little keepsake for you. Uh, do I open this? Yeah, go ahead. Open it up. Oh, look at that. <laughs> so, my wife, my wife doesn't know um, about the Vigilance Elite gummy bears. Yeah. Uh, but she, uh, no doubt, is probably gonna fight me to the death for for these um that's awesome wow i'll, I'll give you a couple extras <laughs> wow and a hat from the, hey from that's a private stash yeah that's awesome yeah yeah absolutely well thank you very much John. i appreciate yeah. it thanks for coming out oh I, i'm glad to be here it's it's been a long time coming and and i'm, I'm really uh humbled to be here for sure well, I'm ready to dive in, man. Are you nervous? I am. Yeah, I sure am. Well, if it helps you at all, everybody that's been on this show says the exact same thing, how nervous they are. And, and to be honest with you, I get just as nervous. You know, yeah. I don't like being in the limelight. Yeah. I always get a little anxious. And then uh, but once it goes on, once the show kind of rolls on, you'll get more comfortable. It'll be fine. And... Uh, and uh, you look kind of nervous in that restaurant last night too. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, this is a. Uh, I mean, this has been going on since um, what I think the first time I had contact with you was in early 2019, January, February, March, something like that. Um, so it's it's been uh, building for a couple of years now, and to have it uh, finally come around and happen, uh, it's a really big thing for me. So I, I, I'm really I'm very happy to be here, but yeah, nervous as hell. Yeah. Well, don't be too nervous. You know how many people sat in that chair that have saved a six-month-old girl from being murdered by their father? No. <laughs> Probably none of them. So, uh, yeah. uh, so, you know, there's that. Yeah, there is. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's difficult to be in the limelight. It's, it's, it's a tough thing. Yeah, I know. But, uh, all right, moving on. So we, we met initially from an email. Right. And uh, I actually read that email before you got here so the audience can hear it. And uh, you talked about some of the struggles you were overcoming, and you were even humble in that email. You were saying that uh, you, you didn't even tell me what you did. I had to Google it. You, you dropped that little, if you want to know more, you can Google my name. So right. sure as shit, I Google your name, and I was like, oh, man. 
And uh, so we kind of connected <clears throat> and uh, been going back and forth over the past, what, two years, Yeah, I think, maybe a little bit longer. And, uh, and, uh, and now here we are today. But he brought up a couple of different incidents um, that you've dealt with being a, a law enforcement officer. And I wanted to kind of bring that up because when we get into, you know, what happened on that day back in December of 18. Mm-hmm. Yeah, December 17th of 2018. Yep, yeah. December 7th. December 18th of 17th, 20, 17th of 2018. <laughs> yeah. See, yeah. It was 10 to 8 in the morning too. I'm just yeah. going to quit. But, <laughs> but, um, but uh, I kind of want to paint a picture. That's not, I don't think that's a rare occurrence. No. You know, for somebody like you. And how long have you been in law enforcement? Um, you know, I started, I, I actually started my career in 99. Um, had a super bad experience with the agency I was with and got out of it and then got back in it in late 2003. Uh, so I was in it from 2003 to, you know, uh, just before 2019 started. So the better part of 20 years. Yep. And, um, and, uh, and that's, I mean, would you say things like that are a daily occurrence? Um, in, in, in my career, what I saw every day, um, all up through the ranks and as a chief even, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't necessarily a daily occurrence, but it was most definitely something uh, that could occur any day, every single day. Yeah. You'd brought up in your email, fighting for your life in the middle of the highway. Yeah, that uh, that happened more than um, more than I ever wanted it to. That's for certain. Um, and I I had a, that actually I'd forgotten. You know, like I said, I couldn't find that email, so I kind of forgot about some of this a little bit. But uh, yeah, there was a few occurrences like that that happened to me when I was uh, when I was with my first agency, and um, you know, I wasn't the only officer that ever had to deal with that, and I'm sure. You know, there's been, you know, thousands of officers since that have, but, uh, you know, you, all through the academy, uh, you know, I went to the Law Enforcement Training Center in Kansas and uh, for the academy, and they taught you through there. They kept talking about uh, the warrior mindset, um, you know, your adrenaline, you know, the dump, everything. And, and until a person experiences it, you just don't, and none of that clicks because it's just words on paper until it happens to you. And, uh, you know, when you've got a guy a lot bigger than, than you are, and, and I was a decent sized guy, um, but when you've got somebody that's bigger than you and you're just, you're not only having to fight that person, but you have to fight that person to stay away from the weapons that you possess so that they can't use those against you. Um, there's a lot that goes into that. And it's, it's definitely, uh, I, I would compare it with uh, sliding in the mud toward a, toward a hundred foot drop and just trying to grab anything you can to keep it from happening. That's, that'd probably be a really good comparison. Yeah. Well, real quick. Um, so I have a, a, paid, a thing called Patreon, which is basically a subscription account. And uh, basically what we do there is we have a bunch of behind the scenes type footage. Uh, we do video teleconferencing uh, with our subscribers and, and basically what our subscribers on Patreon do is they, they are the ones that support this show. They're gotcha. the reason that it happens and that, that we're able to put all this together, all the equipment, the, the salaries, everything. And so one thing I promise them is I give them a heads up on who's coming, uh, on the show before a couple days before they get here. And I pick, uh, a question or two that yeah. they have. Uh, for the guest. So this question is from Nate Hills and um, he just says, in your opinion, do you think police officers get sufficient training to do the job these days? No, not a, not even close. Not even no. close. No, most academies are uh, usually about three and a half months long. Um, and when you take into, into, when you throw into the mix that you've got one individual that you expect to go out and do all these things and it's not going to matter if it's an officer working for a rural city you know of 1800 people or, or a metropolitan city you know with several hundred thousand um the training is just not there in the academies at all uh, and and having having been through st two different states um and seeing the the different training in the two different states um some states definitely need it way more than others um and there should really be 
some kind of a nationally mandated training that they have to go through, whether it's developed by, you know, an allegiance of chiefs of police or sheriffs or whatever it is, um, the, it, the training has to be upped and it has to be upped a lot. Right on. I've heard that from uh, several different police officers. I bet. And, uh, yeah, sounds like they need to up the funding and not mm. decrease the funding, <laughs> uh, which is... Well, and I was, I was fortunate enough at, when I was a chief um, that the city that I was a chief for, um, most of the most of the government for that city and, and the citizens for that city were very pro-police. Um, and I was able to take my officers out and just do extensive training almost every single week. And, you know, I never really got balked at by except maybe a couple of board members. Um, you know, they couldn't understand why we were spending the money we were to, to train officers. Um, I'm confident I know who those two guys voted for. Yeah. yeah. Do you think, it's a tough question, do you think there are a handful of officers out there that do let the authority go to their head and they take advantage of it? Yeah, absolutely. I would, I would go so far as to say um, at some point, especially in a young career, uh, that's that's going to happen to probably 40% or greater. That many? I believe so, yeah. Simply based on based on my experiences um, with the officers that I I was privileged enough to work with over the years and, and seeing things, um, yeah. And, you know, I'm not 100% sure, you know, what you mean by take advantage of, but in, in my mind, um, I call it badge happy. Uh, where they they pin that badge on and then they feel like they're they're the shit and uh, they take they don't take no for an answer and they're delegating law and in their own mind they're they're they, they've kind of got a little bit of a god complex you know you're going to do this because I said so you know that's that type of thing and um, that that puts law enforcement in a bad light and that's that's another place where uh, where training would would be a big plus really yeah oh I think so yeah what kind of training do you think would um, with that well, you know, nowhere in the academy training that I received or the continuing education hours that I went through, and there, there was a lot, at least 700 continuing education hours that I went through, nowhere in any of that did I ever hear the word humble. Um, and I think being humble is something that has to go with that badge. It has to. It, it, it gives it value. Yeah. Interesting. Would you say, you said younger in the career, or, or early on in a young officer's career, do most people grow out of that? Oh, I think so, yeah. I mean, there's, I think there's gonna be a few that probably never will, and uh, it's just not the right place for them, and I, I believe uh, they'll be weeded out. One thing I've definitely learned about law enforcement is when somebody gets in that doesn't belong, they're, they're weeded out. They, whether it's by their fellow officers um, or administration, you know, or, or citizens, uh, they, they end up getting weeded out eventually. But yeah, it's, uh, it's the, the people in the first couple of years of their career, they don't have the experience yet to learn, you know, what the compassion part is all about. Okay. Right on. Well, let's take just a real quick break. And uh, when we come back, I want to go into some of the worst things that you've seen as a police officer to kind of paint a picture of what you guys are dealing with every day. Sure. What's going on, Patreon? Hey Join me on Vigilance Elite Patreon for a live video teleconference. All right, we're back from our 30 second break there. But um, <laughs> what, what are some of the worst things that you've seen? What are the, some of the worst scenes that you've rolled up on as a law enforcement officer? Well, I mean, obviously not, not counting, um, you know, the child in the pond. Um, as a, as a sergeant, um, I would show up on a scene, 
Uh, and the one in my mind right now is just it's a fatality accident. Pretty much any officer uh, has to has to work a fatality accident at some point or another, or at least at least be a part of one, um, a part of an investigation on one. And I worked a fatality accident. I was the first one on the scene. Um, it was right at the edge of my my city limits uh, when I was a sergeant. I was actually eating dinner at the time when the call came out, and I heard where the restaurant was located compared to where the the crash occurred. I heard the crunch from the crash. Um, so I was already up and leaving the table when, when I got the call. Uh, I was first on the scene, on the scene for about uh, 16 minutes by myself, um, waiting on other officers to get there, deputies, things like that. And it ended up being a three car accident. And what had happened was uh, one vehicle um, in a Toyota 4Runner ran a stop sign out into a 65 mile an hour four lane intersection. Um, hit one vehicle knocked it into another one and uh when i got on scene there was a a young hispanic male walking around and seemed fine i thought he was a witness and so i i, I grabbed him and said, stood him to the side told him don't leave you know uh, i wanted to get a statement from him at some point when i was done dealing with the people uh went and uh and dealt with uh the first vehicle it was a 16 year old that was that had passed away already um ended up being somebody that was good friends with my kids so, oh, man. Uh, kind of familiar with her. And then uh, the other vehicle um, was a family. Um, mom and dad were both injured. Dad was unconscious. Uh, but anyways, I, I assessed everything, got back on with dispatch, uh, eventually um, got coverings put over the 16-year-old. The uh, public doesn't need to see that. And then... Uh, <clears throat> Went over to the Hispanic male. Uh, once EMS, you know, uh, uh, emergency medical services showed up, I went back over to the Hispanic male, started talking to him. Turned out he was the operator of the Toyota 4Runner that had caused the accident that actually blew the stop sign and, and hit these vehicles. And so uh, immediately uh, there was a, a deputy that showed up on scene. Uh, he was very adamant that this was in his jurisdiction, not mine. I said, okay, here he is. I've smelled alcohol on him. This is the driver and the cause of this accident. He's in your custody now. There was no field sobriety testing done by that deputy um, or anything else. And long story short, that individual ended up with a $75 fine for running a stop sign. That was it. You got to be shitting me. No. No. So that was a bad one. Um, but That's infuriating. Oh yeah, yeah, I I agree. Um, you know, one of my officers uh, when I was a sergeant, damn good officer, a uh, really good man. Uh, he uh, he had a child pass away while he was giving him CPR. If I remember, it was an eight-year-old boy having a uh, asthma attack, and uh, the uh, the inhaler was with the parents. Uh, couldn't be found. They weren't on scene. Uh, they were they were elsewhere I'll just I'll leave it at that but um, what were they doing partying partying yeah but uh, you know uh, that officer ended up getting sued by the parents for wrongful death so I mean it's the world that law enforcement has to deal with is uh, is pretty incredible when you dig in deep um, and there's a, a huge amount of of officers out there that just and it's in and I know anybody in a profession like this um, fire department hell even social working like we spoke about uh, knows how to compartmentalize they've learned it somehow and they just do it um, and so you just go through your career and try your best not to open those boxes yeah, <clears throat> yeah. I can definitely relate to that yeah. And you get real good at it. Oh, yeah. Until it catches up with you. Exactly. But, um, you know, I guess kind of what I'm, what I'm kind of trying to bring out of you here is law enforcement, you, you guys deal with the worst of people. Oh, yeah. The worst of people, and you deal with the worst people on their worst days. Yes. And, uh, and that... I'm assuming is damn near a daily occurrence sometimes probably three four maybe five six times a day yeah well I know in my career um, 
I was never just randomly invited to a birthday party. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, uh, no, it's, it, my, when I was a chief, my lieutenant at Fordham, he, uh, wonderful man, really good guy. He, he used to say, we have a front seat to the greatest show on earth. Um, and that's obviously just a way to look at it to make it seem much smaller than it is, you know, and, and change it into something that's acceptable. Um, you know, it's, uh, I, there, there's, there's a lot of good days, but the, it, even the good days are going to involve, you know, a domestic violence situation or um, a fatality accident or, you know, uh, a two-year-old getting mauled by a pit bull. I mean, it's, you know, you're going to have good days in law enforcement. Don't get me wrong. It's, it's a wonderful career, and I, I wish to God I was still in it. But every good day is a bad day, too. Yeah. Let's move into December 17th, 2018, when you saved that little girl. Yeah. So I want you to be very descriptive. I want you to talk about every little detail that you saw, that you felt, what you were feeling, what your mindset was, all that kind of stuff. So let's just start at the very beginning. What were you doing? What was the call? All right. Um, yeah, on December 17th of 2018, I was, uh, I was sitting in my office doing payroll uh, for my officers. And uh, I, heard my, I heard my corporal down the hall, my corporal, my lieutenant, and another officer were all uh, in my lieutenant's office, I believe. And I heard my, my corporal scream for me, uh, and, and I could tell by the tone of his voice it was something really serious. Uh, so I, I got up and, and ran out the hall, and, and as soon as I entered into the hallway, um, he said something to the effect of, there's a baby drowning in a pond on Duck Henry Road. We ran out. Um, as I was running down the hall, to the right was my lieutenant's office, the doorway, and the door was open from the hallway into his office. And I saw a man sitting in a chair unrestrained. Um, and he just had that million mile stare. And I, it, my brain associated, hey, this is a suspect in this somehow. Um, somehow when we got in the parking lot, we're getting into our cruisers to go. Uh, I believe my lieutenant had told me, or my corporal had told me that's, that's the father. Uh, he drowned his baby. And so we knew exactly where the pond was. Um, you know, and I, I gotta tell you, in my, in my career, I've never experienced running hot to a call where you didn't have to hit the brakes. I mean, hitting the brakes, swerving, getting out of traffic, getting into other traffic, you know, wrong way, you know, whatever you got to do to get to a call. Um, didn't experience any of that on this. It was like the the streets just parted. The cars were out of the way before we ever had to get to them. Uh, we got to that call uh, faster than I've ever gotten to a call. Um, as soon as I arrived, I, I bailed out of my car, ran down the bank uh, into the water. My corporal was uh, right there with me. He ended up in the water. Uh, he ended up having the baby in his hands and he couldn't get anything to happen. Um, and he turned the baby to me. We dug all kinds of mud and dirt and stuff out of her throat, out of her eyes, cleared her eyes up. Uh, Millie turned her over, started again, um, you know, just uh, doing compressions on her from the back. Um, this was in Kansas City, Missouri. Yeah, Greenwood, just out, yeah, just Greenwood, in Jackson is, County, same county as Kansas City, Missouri. Mm -hmm. Suburb of Kansas City. Yeah. In the middle of December, right, right, December seventeenth. Right. So, what yeah. what was the temperature? Uh, that day, I believe it was in the low twenties. Um, there was ice that we had to break to get in the pond, um, right there by the bank. Um, you uh, had to break ice to get to. Yeah, we we broke. Yeah, we broke through ice as we entered the pond. Yeah. So was she under? The she ice? was. She was face down, floating. Um, and she wasn't under the ice. There wasn't ice as far out as she was. It was just around the bank, around the edges. Um, of course, the water was pretty cold, but... Uh, um, so you get out of the car, you're running down to the pond. Yeah. And the first thing you see is a six-month-old baby girl yeah. face down in a pond yeah. who was murdered yeah. by her father. Yeah, exactly. Um, I can see uh, I can see the back of her head. Uh, that's an image that's still there, uh, little curls on her hair. 
And uh, uh, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, I never, my corporal and I never really had a chance to talk about it afterward. Um, to this day, him and I really haven't sat down and had any kind of discussion about it. Uh, but uh, I'll, I'll get to that part later. But we, uh, <clears throat> I, I believed at that point, uh, before we ever touched the baby, I believed that this was a hoax. Um, because of the color of the baby, it was just pure white. It was like a porcelain doll. Um, I really felt like it was, uh, it was just uh, some guy that uh, had a real bad mental Ill illness problem and believed that he threw a baby in the pond and he didn't. But um, it, it turned out to be a real baby. Uh, as, soon as, uh, as soon as we put hands on it, we knew that. Um, it, was, uh, it was really frantic. Uh, my corporal uh, at that time had uh, two little children, um, a little girl and I believe a little boy. And, uh, you know, so he was still a pretty new father. Uh, my kids were, you know, grown, gone, you know, that sort of thing. But um, I know it had a lot of effect on him at that point. I could, I could definitely see that. Um, but when, uh, when we were up on the bank with the baby and uh, my corporal held the baby out uh, and we're yelling at each other and, and I can't hear him. And I would imagine he probably couldn't hear me. It just nothing soaked in. Uh, we're just going off of just just pure actions, um, more as parents than than anything else uh, at that point. But uh, I reached down that baby's throat and dug out uh, an enormous amount of mud and dirt and grass, um, and uh, and we turned her over. And uh, I had her long long ways on my forearm uh, and started compressions again and. Uh, at some point, you know, she just, uh, she let out a whimper, um, and she was, she was coming to, and as we turned to run back up the bank with her to my, my corporal's vehicle, because he left his vehicle running, and I wanted to get her in the heat as quick as possible, as we turned to run back to that vehicle, <sighs> sorry, I, uh, when I turned, I saw uh, the look on his face, um, and uh, I, I know that uh, he he just he was ready to fall apart, just like I was. But uh, we uh, we got up, <clears throat> got up to the car, got the baby in uh, in the passenger front seat, um, got the heat blowing on her as hard as we could. Uh, I stripped down out of the rest of my uniform on the side of the road and wrapped her in it, uh, trying to get her warm. Um, it seemed like every minute went by, she got a little more coherent. Uh, she started moving her hands and, and looking around. You could see the movement in her eyes finally, you know, uh, things that we weren't seeing at first that was really scaring us um, because at that point, we had no idea how long she'd been in that pond. Um, and, and in my mind, I didn't even know if the father had driven from the pond to the police department or if he had walked. I, I didn't know. And so uh, the more coherent she became, the, the better we felt, you know. And then uh, yeah, I started, I kept talking to her, trying to get her attention, get her to, to look at me. I wanted to, I wasn't even worried about hearing or anything like that. I just wanted her to just, um, just be more coherent, you know, and, and, and come to more and, and, and start acting like a baby should. Um, then I started calling her Goose, and I, I don't know why, but started calling her Goose and, and nicknamed her that. But, uh, you know, she finally started looking at us. She was looking around the car. Um, and then uh, uh, a, a guy had pulled up that lived close by, a uh, citizen. And, uh, you know, I wanted to know if everything was okay. I, I asked him if he had any blankets, anything in the car we could use. And, and he said, no, but he lived right down the street. He'll go get some. And so he took off and went back to his house to get some, um, which, you know, the, the people in that area, that's, that's, that's the way they are. But uh, uh, the fire department showed up with their bus, their, their ambulance. Um, when they finally came over into custody, I almost didn't want to give the baby to them. Uh, I almost felt like that she needed to stay with me. Um, but uh, that's not how it works. But uh, so they got her on the bus, uh, started working with her. Um, five or six minutes went by, I would guess, you know, that she was on that bus. 
And uh, I couldn't even tell you what my corporal was doing at that time. He, for all I know, he might have been on the bus. It just, uh, you know, there's a lot of a lot of things going through your head, you know, at that point. So you don't, uh, you, you kind of lose touch with with what's going on around you, uh, at least in my case. But uh, my corporal, I remember my corporal approached me and he said, I, "She, they're telling me that she's going to be okay. She's she's going to be stable. She's suffering from severe hypothermia and she'll be okay." Something just you know, clicked in my head back to the suspect, the father, sitting in my lieutenant's office unrestrained as I ran past. Um, that, that, that image went right back in my head and I, I got back in my, my police car and ran hot straight back down to the police de department. Uh, before we go back into that, yeah. before we go back into that, what's this little girl's name? I don't know. I really couldn't tell you. I honestly couldn't. I don't know her name. And I, to be honest with you, and I know this isn't going to sound very good at this moment. Um, right now, I don't want to know her name. But uh, uh, I, I hope at some point, um, you know, eight or nine years down the road, I'll get to meet her. I would. I would love that. I hope you get to meet her too. The report says that she was underwater for an estimated, I think, eight to 10 minutes yeah. uh, before you guys got there. Right. That's a long time in 20 it degree is. weather. It is. And, and underwater. You know, uh, my corporal, uh, I think he's been promoted since then, but uh, my corporal, um, he's probably one of the best guys I ever trained, probably one of the best guys I've ever worked with. Uh, and I, one of the things that him and I did talk about um, when we got back to the police department after everything was was over with, you know, he uh, he said the baby's body temperature was measured at eighty six point seven degrees, I believe. I know it was it was either eighty six point seven or eighty seven point six. Either way, it's extremely low. Um, now I'm not taking anything away from my corporal or myself uh, in any means, but I'm, I'm telling you. If that child's body temperature wasn't what it was, we would never have been able to save her. Um, so we were just an after effect. Her, her organs slowing down the way they did because of her body temperature is, is, is a big part of what saved that child's life. Definitely. Damn, Damn man. That's some heavy shit. Yeah. 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 But... Uh, is there anything else that happened on scene that you want to talk about? On scene? Um, no, you know, I just, uh, you know, I've, I've had to tell the story a couple of times, but I do it from a very far distance, if that makes sense to you. Yeah. Um, so the closer I get to the story, the tougher it is to tell. But uh, it just, uh, on scene, you know, the, the memory of the guy pulling up and, and asking to help, you know, that's, uh, that's, that's just the way those people are around that city. And uh, the support that, that the citizens gave me afterwards uh, was a big reflection of that too. But um, back, to, uh, back to the story, what, uh, what happened was uh, when I entered into the police department parking lot, there's, when you enter the building, there was a, an outer door that you go into and then you're in a little foyer area. You've got two different doors you can go through. There's one that goes, if you go straight through, um, that door takes you down a hallway, uh, goes to our squad room, evidence room, my office, another office. If you take an immediate left and go through that door, straight into my lieutenant's office, which is where the suspect was. So the only way to get into either one of those doors is with a four digit code. And it's by policy, those doors have to be shut which that code's always activated no matter what when they're shut. Um, when I got out of my police car, ran through the parking lot, I remember grabbing that door to the outer foyer, the public entrance. I yanked it open, entered that foyer. I don't remember ever putting a code in. Um, I don't remember opening a door. The next memory that I've got is, is me being uh, basically uh, punched, kicked, choked, uh, yelled at, screamed at by my lieutenant and other officers trying to get me off the guy. Um, I remember seeing the guy on the floor underneath me 
and it was very easy for me to figure out what I did. Um, you know that 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 kind of a picture. Uh, you, you don't you don't mistake what what you just did to somebody, and I didn't. Um, I immediately uh, called my uh, well, actually my city clerk, great woman. She she heard some of the ruckus from city hall. Uh, they're connected to the police department, and she came over and was screaming, wanting to know what's going on. Is everybody okay? And uh, I said, yeah, yeah, it's okay. Um, I was in a pretty bad state. At that point, and I just said, uh, I, re I resign. I quit. Um, she said, no. no we're not going to let you. And uh, uh, I shut myself in my office and uh, stayed in there for about 20 minutes, trying to get myself calmed down. And then uh, 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 called my mayor, uh, Levi Weaver, good, good man. Um, I told him I was going to resign. I said, I, I resign. I quit. I resigned my post. And uh, he didn't know what had happened. He had zero idea. And uh, he said, Chief, no, never. And uh, he wouldn't let me. So um, that's uh, that's kind of be gloves with. So that that was big. That sounds like a hell of a, a hell of a team. Yeah. You want to take a break? Yeah. Let's take a break. <laughs>so we're back you got a stiff drink yeah. numb it out a little bit yeah and uh but where we left off of basically it sounds like the mayor the clerk it sounds like everybody kind of had your had your back or was behind you yeah they definitely did um in, in a way that i never really saw coming uh my my mayor demanded um that i be because by the policies that I developed myself, um, a person that was involved, an officer that was involved in a critical incident such as that one, um, if there were anything that happened that would be in question at all or up for investigation, they had to go on paid administrative leave or unpaid administrative leave. That choice had to be made by the mayor um, or the board of aldermen and the mayor. But uh, um, I was put on administrative leave, paid administrative leave, um, and, and I can't really be accurate with how long, but I would say it was probably a good two months, uh, maybe a little bit longer. Um, talked to my mayor every day, uh, every single day. The man called me, um, wanted to know, you know, make sure things were good, uh, where my mind was. Um, kept talking to me about other problems in the city, you know, things going on. Uh, he wanted to make sure that my guys were doing uh, what I wanted them to do to keep the, the city running the way I wanted it to run. Um, I was, I mean, don't, I don't want to paint a picture of myself that's not, that's not accurate. I, I was a big fish in a little pond is what I was and that's how I look at that. Um, but uh, yeah, they, they, they stood behind me, um, you know, and then, uh, you know, my city clerk, my core clerk, uh, the utilities lady. I mean, they were all texting me, calling me uh, a few times a week, checking on me, seeing how things were going. Um, one of the policies that had been put in place was, uh, that came into effect immediately after that happened. Uh, I had written a policy uh, with the help of my captain, Hawkins, uh, which was, uh, he's probably the best cop I've ever met in my life. Um, but that policy stated, if as an officer, if you're involved in a critical incident, uh, immediately you have to be disassociated from that incident, um, from your duty. Uh, the counselor has to be called. You have to, you know, I, I don't remember now what I had in the policy. I think it was within eight hours you had to be in a session with a counselor. Um, somebody unassociated from the department, unassociated with that event, had to come in and run the show. Um, 
so obviously if it was just an officer that was involved or you know a corporal sergeant whatever i'd still be running that show without any problems no, no hiccups uh, but because i was involved my captain had to come in and run the show he was off duty that day completely uninvolved so he came in and ran the show ran the department in my absence um he set everything up himself for us to go see the counselor myself and the and the corporal in separate sessions uh so by gosh man that happened the guy walked in the police department the father walked in the pd 10 to 8 in the morning um somewhere around one o'clock in the afternoon, we already had our appointment set for like five and 5.30 that evening uh, with the counselor. And so we, we did that, did our counseling sessions. Um, I ended up continuing going back to that counselor because he was actually an ex-police officer himself. Uh, so it was kind of easy to talk to the guy, but uh, uh, you know, it, uh, it, 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 it's just kind of a side note and I, I, I getting away from the story just for a second, but uh, I mean, if there's police departments out there, especially rural ones that don't have a, a policy like that in effect, my God, get it on the books. Um, that was that was detrimental, especially for myself and my corporal, um, but it was detrimental for my department and the liability on my department for us to be taken out of that picture completely. Um, that uh, that helped everybody go on with their business and and keep being cops um, for the rest of that day and and uh, it got us some some immediate attention to to the trauma that we just experienced. That's that's good. Yeah, yeah, it was it was a good thing, uh, and you know, my captain and I spent a lot of time and, and I know. <laughs> God, I know looking back, my officers probably thought, you know, chief and captain, they probably go out and drink after work. They probably hang out all the time. To this day, I've never been to his house, ever. Uh, I've known the man, uh, God, since, well, in law enforcement, I've known him since 2004. Uh, he started working for me in, what, I think 2016. Um, and I've, I've never been to his house. He's, he'd never been to mine other than to come and pick up my cruiser. Um, but... Uh, you know, him and I would sit and just hash things out. What if, what if, what if, you know? Um, and uh, that, that helped develop a lot, of, uh, a lot of good training and a lot of good policies. <clears throat> so you don't remember exactly, you don't remember exactly what happened when you tuned the father right. up who right. tried to drown his, or who did drown his daughter, right. but when did you, it sounds like you completely shut that out of memory. Yeah, um, so. What, what did you see, how, how bad was it when you came to? Uh, it was, the, the, the dump that I was having, the adrenaline dump that I was having when I came to you, I, I, I had people there to hold me up. And if I didn't, I'd been on the ground. Uh, it was, it was, uh, it was very sudden. Um, and uh, I still had uh, just this, uh, this, 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 uh, this rage, um, you know, and I, I, I know looking back and, and having seen the, the body camera footage, I, I know personally um, what would have happened if, if those officers weren't there to, to get me off. Yeah. Um, but, uh, my mindset when when my my conscience came back to me uh, immediately wasn't wasn't really on the father. Um, you know, he was of course he's he's injured. You know, he's he's got some blood on his face and stuff. And uh, the million miles miles stared never went away. I mean, it never left that man. He it looked like the soul was gone. There was no soul behind his eyes, and that's exactly how he looked when I ran past him going down the hall to go to that call. Um, it's just a different kind of evil. It is it's the best way for me to put it, and I recognize that when I when I when my memory came back to me, that's that's one of the first things I remember was was in my head, just just thinking, man, that's that's a brand new kind of evil. I haven't seen that, and uh, uh, you know it, uh, uh, I, and then everything just just came to mind, uh, the realization of what I'd just done to my career, what I just did to myself, what I did to my department. So what? Um so, but he wasn't—he wasn't seriously injured or anything. 
No, as far as I know, no broken bones. Um, you know, he some some uh, lacerations and things to his face, and uh, maybe some bruised ribs and things like that. But uh, uh, nothing, nothing permanent. No dismemberment or anything. All right. So you, I mean, you just I assaulted the man. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you saw. Well, I mean, your emotions. I mean, that's a yeah. lot to take in, and yeah. then to see the man that did it right after you save this girl you know i mean yeah. i don't think there's a whole lot of people out there that could have held that together to begin with but um so you're on two months leave when then what happened um i was on leave for a couple months and then uh i had an fop attorney um and they they need to work on their game but uh um What's an FOP attorney? Uh, federal order of police, fraternal order of police, uh, like a union attorney. Okay. Um, provided to me by the FOP. And, uh, you know, I was told he was a very good attorney, and, and, and I won't mention his name or anything like that. I'll just say that I, it didn't work out for me. Um, but as soon as we learned that it was going federal, which was right about the end of that two months of my paid leave, um, I, uh, I had FBI agents show up at my door at my home. Um, and I, to backtrack a little, so that happened on December 17th of 2018. On December 23rd, which was the Friday after that, that happened on a Tuesday. On that Friday, I had surgery on my right shoulder uh, from lifting weights. I, uh, I ended up tearing up my, my shoulder pretty bad and had to have a couple surgeries on it. So I was down with that also. Um, and so anyways, uh, go forward a couple months, I, I'm still in a brace and stuff on my shoulder. And uh, FBI shows up at my door and, and serves me with an indictment for a civil right violation against the father. Um, the two FBI agents that, were, that, that came to my door were uh, extremely professional, uh, good, good people, I would say. Um, uh, they, they were compassionate and, and um, you know, I appreciate them for the, for the job they did. Um, and I know that's, the, that's what they were doing was, was their job. Um, but. Um, Getting that federal indictment uh, opened my eyes up to the fact that, uh, man, you know, what's, what's the smallest thing you can do in law enforcement um, as an officer or as a rank or as a chief even um, and, and not be put under a federal indictment, you know? Um, because to me, the, the, the punishment outweighed the, the act a lot. Uh, and and it, I know things don't have to be fair, and, and you know, I violated my oath that I took. I, I understand that. I understood that from the moment that I, that I came to. Um, and I have to live with that for the rest of my life because I was, and still am, extremely serious about that oath. Um, but, you know, the first thing I did uh, when I got that indictment, uh, I was trying to figure out what to do. I, I first person I spoke with was my mayor, and uh, ended up talking to um, the actual union rep uh, from the county, and uh, ended up getting the name of an attorney, a federal attorney. I got in touch with him. Uh, he was actually a, a prosecutor for the Justice Department at one time. Um, got in touch with him and uh, retained him. Went in, talked to him, told him my story, um, and he was. Uh, he was the right choice for sure. Damn good man. Glad I've got him. But um, it's uh, looking back on this entire thing and thinking about the, you know, the the was it two and a half years, you know, since it happened. Um, you know, I, I'm a firearms instructor. Uh, you know, I taught uh, pistol combat tac tactics, rifle combat tactics. A patrol rifle instructor, uh, instructor for uh, active shooter, response to active shooter, um, you know, and, and a few other things. And it's, uh, you know, as always in the back of my mind, my retirement gig was going um, to be to go around and train law enforcement. And, uh, you know, a federal indictment, you, you can't be in possession of firearms. Um, you, you can't, even, uh, can't even own them. Uh, so the day after I got that indictment, what I ended up doing was going to the local gun store and sold uh, sold uh, both my Daniel Defense rifles, uh, my Mark 18, 
well, you have my Mark 18 and my DDMR7 or 7R, and then uh, my SIG 320, 365, um, a couple of 1911 Springfields I had. Sold, sold everything. Sold all of them. Sold it all. Got a receipt, uh, so I'd have something to turn in as proof. Um, I, I, I'm not. I'm not saying I'm the best rule follower that there is, but you know, in, the, in in that case at that time, I felt like following the rules is exactly what I needed to do, and and I know I had the option to, you know, sell them to friends, um, or uh, have somebody do safekeeping for me. But uh, at that point, I felt like the best thing to do was to do something um, that was on paper. Uh, that I had a receipt for, had paperwork for, uh, and and they could be checked into real easy for them for the for the U.S. Justice Department, um, and so that's how I did that. But uh, you know, it was almost like, and and God, I'm gonna catch some slack from my kids for saying this, but it was almost like uh, I went back home after after selling the guns, and it was like all my kids had just left home for the first time. It just it it was rough, yeah, because um, you know guns are pretty things, you yeah, know? but. Uh, yeah, so it's, it, there are some life changes that, that take a lot of getting used to, and I'm not used to them at all yet. You know, it's... who who's the one that decided that uh, who who is behind all this this big push to indict you and uh, the the federal prosecutor? And, and to be honest with you, Sean, I'd have to look at the paper to tell you what his name is. I when I read through those, I don't look at the headings. I just I just yep. look at the content, and that's it. But um, yeah, the federal prosecutors for the Justice Department in Kansas City. Yeah, um, you know, and, and I'm I'm not saying that they're bad people or that uh, that they got their heads screwed on wrong or anything like that whatsoever. What I'm saying is, um, man, you know, there's black and white and there's gray, and the best officers I've ever seen on the planet, the best law enforcement people, federal down to. A, a town of 200 people. The best law enforcement I've ever seen know where that gray is and know to look at that gray to make a decision. And yeah. I don't feel like that was done. I think it sounds like, you know, um, there's a time to give a slap on a wrist and there's a time to throw the fucking book at you. Right. And uh, these guys threw the book at you for saving a six month old baby. Yeah. Yeah. Are they still there? Or they are. Yeah. 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 They are. Yeah. They are. Um, yeah. Uh, it was really a, a strange thing. We went to the to the Justice Department, the federal courthouse, a couple of different times. My attorney and I for uh, a couple of meetings that we had to do with them. Um, I had to get a uh, a PO, um, which in this sense is a pretrial officer, yeah, but it's a PO is a PO is. Um, I was fortunate enough that uh, the one I got in Kansas City was was great. Um, she knew her job very well. Um, she she told me exactly what I need to do when I need to do it, and I followed those rules, and I never had any problems at all. Um, she came out and did her first house check uh, with me because under a federal indictment, so they I had to check in once a week with the PO to let them know, hey, you know, I'm still alive, still. In this area, I haven't left. Um, if I wanted to travel outside of, uh, I think it was three different counties there around me. If I wanted to travel outside of that area, I had to call and get permission uh, to do that. Um, you know, it uh, uh, changing jobs. I had to notify them, um, and, and and those are things that uh, you know a, a, a free person is not used to doing, and that's that just you know it sinks in when you go to bed at night. Um, but she, she did her job well. She was, she was great. I have no complaints whatsoever about her. Uh, she's a pretty decent person. When she came out and did the house check, um, my, I, I had a, a, a stairwell that went down to my basement. And my basement was my man cave, had all my awards and crap, all my, my old chief used to call it a love me wall. Mm -hmm. And so I had my love me wall down there and, you know, all my junk. And, um, she, uh, she spent some time looking over those things, and uh, when she was done looking at those things, she was done with her house check, and uh, that was the only one that, that I ever had to deal with, you know, while I lived in that area. Um, later on, I ended up moving, and they had to come out and do a house check, but uh, that was in a different residence altogether. But, um, you know, I, I, 
I, I can't complain about the about the Justice Department because I I realize if if I go black and white, they're doing their job. You know, I mean, they're to me they're 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 going after something that um, that they probably shouldn't have, um, but I but I know in the end they're doing their job. Um, when uh, when law enforcement started getting a really bad light, uh, and, and and I mean by bad light. Um, Good shootings, um, good arrests were being made, but being seen as bad yeah. uh, and publicized through the media, um, I, I got scared, and my attorney got scared. I made, I, I initiated a phone call with my attorney, and I said, "Look, I, I'm not sure about this. You know, uh, doing a jury trial on this is, is scary at this moment because of the way law enforcement is being looked at." Um, and he agreed, and. Uh, so we approached the Justice Department with a plea, and the the plea basically was, um, you know, plead guilty to this in exchange for uh, so much time in probation. Um, it would be something that my life wouldn't be altered too much from its current state. Um, however, uh, you know, there's there's nothing set in stone on that. Uh, the the Justice Department agreed to it, um, as as you saw. Um, but the judge does has has he has the option to uh, to throw out my plea um, and take it to trial uh, or to instill a harsher punishment, um, you know. And out of everything that I've heard about it so far, and and you got to understand by this time, um, and I'm sure I'm I'm not the only person that's experienced something like this. But by this time, any time that uh, the new information comes forward to me about my case um, on the federal level, it just it's like throwing clothes in the washing machine. It just gets mixed together. And, I, you know, it's just, uh, it's just more shit thrown into the mix. And um, the last thing uh, during the plea hearing, uh, after it, the last thing I knew of, and I, and I think you saw it in the paperwork that I gave you, um, they're also calling for restitution for the father. Yep. For me to pay restitution to that man out of my pocket. Uh, that's tough to swallow. That's rough. Uh, that one, I'm not really sure if my brain's ever going to get wrapped around that. Uh, that's that's just me. It's uh, man, you know, that's like uh, you know, that's like giving a bully a gold star for a day. You know, yep. it doesn't make sense to me. I don't think it makes sense to anybody, but probably those prosecutors. Right. Yeah. They. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I don't think there's anybody that's going to see this that's going to understand why they would uh, why that would why that would even be a thing. But yeah. um, you know, wow. So where does it stand? Where is everything right now? So right now, uh, in the first week of December, um, I've got a uh, sentencing hearing that I have to appear for. Um, I don't know, uh, I don't know the time off the top of my head right now, but anyways, it's, I have a sentencing hearing that I have to appear for and that's where I'm going to find out the end result of, of what's actually gonna happen, what's gonna be set in stone. Um, I'm really nervous about that uh, because um, I just, uh, with some of the things I've seen so far, nothing has gone anywhere near the way I thought it would. Um, and I always try and look at things at, as how I would do it, how I would handle it, or, or, or what decision I would make in it. And it just doesn't apply to this uh, because there's already decisions made that I never would have made. Um, it's just, uh, you know, there's, there's some comfort to, to, to things in my mind about it. Um, but uh, I don't know, I don't even know what the best case scenario is now, to be honest with you. Um, if, if it gets thrown out, if the judge decides to throw it out, throw out my plea, uh, then, uh, we withdraw my plea and we go to trial. If we go to trial, I mean, hell, it took the justice department two and a half years to get here. Yeah. You know, um, how long will it be until the trial, you know, and will I still be on this, this pretrial thing, you know, 
uh, or pre-sentence thing with a pre-sentencing officer. You know, I, there, I still have questions about it and I still don't know what the outcomes are. And um, until December happens, I, I just won't know. If it, if it goes to trial, my personal feeling is they can't find 12 people to put on a jury that are going to agree that I'm guilty. I, I just don't see where that would happen. To me, out of 12, there's gonna be a parent, there's, there's going to be somebody that has a brother or sister as a law enforcement officer, and they're going to, to look at this and go, you know what, yeah, you know, you, you see a baby come back to life that was drowned by his own father, and all you do is assault a man. You, it, Who did it? Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 so I, I just don't, uh, I don't, I don't know where it's gonna go, but that's, that's definitely a worry of mine. You know, I'm trying to build a, trying to get my future going, um, trying to make things work out for me and, and, and my new wife. And, uh, um, you know, this is just a cloud, you know, it just hangs right over the top. Where is the father now? So uh, about a month, about a month ago, um, I saw that he was sentenced to 15 years. Uh, but it's to my understanding that he is currently in a mental health institution, um, which the hitting that I saw, the hit, the it said that uh, he was sentenced to 15 years in, I want to say Jackson County Jail. But, so, sorry, if, let yeah. me interrupt. If I remember right, last night you said you were possibly on the hook for 20 years. And this guy got 15 years? No, 12. Yeah, me on 12, yeah. Yeah, possibly 12 for me, yeah. Yeah, he got, so he got 15 years. Um, so if you punch somebody who drowned their six-month-old baby, you're going to get yeah. 12 years. But if you decide you want to drown your six-month-old baby, all you have to do is add another three years. Yeah, so yeah, that's, yeah that's, that's the math. Um, but, I, you know, i got to add to that, to be fair to, my, to myself. Um, you know... But, I acted under the color of law, and and I didn't. Going into this, I I had no experience with the federal side as far as sentencing and and things like that. And they have guidelines that they follow. And basically, if you do this, it's it's this many points, and this this many points. And then if you if you confess or you plead guilty, then it's this many points taken away. Well, they go through this point system, and that's how they figure out what kind of time that you're going to do it. Uh, it's pretty interesting um, and scary as hell uh, yeah. because it makes zero sense to me. Um, and I'm, I'm not an idiot, but man, that made zero sense to me. Uh, but uh, I mean, it, there is still, there's a good possibility that, uh, you know, the judge could say, you know what, you two years confinement would do you some good, let's put you there, you know, or he could, he could put me in a, in a mental health institution, you know. Um, do you have a gauge on that judge? I don't. No? No, I don't. He's been practicing for a long, long time, and he seems like he's a, he's a very sharp man. Um, and, and But my plea hearing is the only experience that I have with him, so I, I just don't have any kind of a gauge on him yet. All right. Well, I don't want to go into, I mean, we spoke last night about how much this has damaged your your life afterwards and, and, and with previous relationships and, right. and family. And I don't want to, I don't want to make you go back into that. And, uh, I think we have exactly what we need for the audience, but you know, I said at the beginning, you know, what you were here for, I want you to say, you know, why, why you came here and what do you want to get out of this interview? to the people that are watching. Um, okay. Uh, there's, there's two things that, that, I, that I hope this accomplishes. Um, well, three, I mean, I got to meet you, so that's one, you know, <laughs> you're, you're a star, so. Um, but uh, the two things are, uh, you know, first and foremost, there's, there's a woman on, on Facebook that reached out to me uh, from Ohio, her name is uh, Charlene, and uh, she started this support group on Facebook, just she she reached out to me one day and just said, "Hey, do you mind if I do this?" And I said, "No, knock your socks off, you know, have at it." And uh, I know there's like uh, like almost a thousand people on that support page now, 
Um, and then recently she started a petition. Uh, this is all out of the goodness of her heart. Um, uh, it was, uh, it's, it's, it's an amazing thing, but there's uh, close to 400 people on that petition now, I think. Uh, I don't know that the support page or the petition would, would do any good uh, on the federal side. They might look at something like that and just kind of giggle to themselves. I, I don't know, but um, those things are out there. Um, and, I, and I'd love to see, I'd love to see both grow. Um, we'll link that below in the description. And then, uh, you know, the other thing is, um, you know, obviously I've still got a lot of, a lot of friends in law enforcement. And there's a lot of people that have made contact with me that just started their careers. Um, I couldn't, I, I could show you after this, the messages, but I've had people contact me from South Africa, from, uh, Australia from all over the world um, languages I don't understand uh, and, and one of them I'll, I really I'd like to show you just so you can tell me maybe you know what language it is uh, but it kind of almost looks Russian but I'm not sure but anyways I've had people contact me from all over the world um, giving me support in, in messages and and that's as, as so humbling it's, it's unreal uh, then uh, uh, they uh, it's, 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 it's good to know that there's that many people on the planet, you know, that, that have good hearts because uh, when you watch the news or something now, it's just scary as hell. It just gets worse every day. Um, but what I'd like to accomplish, the second thing is uh, law enforcement that's on duty now needs to understand the, the administration and their bosses, the, the, the board members, um, uh, you know, the commissioners, they, they all have got to understand that mental health is not only something law enforcement has to deal with on duty. They have to deal with it themselves in their own body, at home, with their families. Um, and that's not being recognized, and it needs to be. It really does. Uh, I've got my battles. I know plenty of other officers that have their own battles that are, that are as bad or worse than mine. Um, and they... they Unless they do the seven free visits they get through their job with a counselor that's never, ever been in law enforcement and probably most likely never held a gun in their life, uh, you know, what are they going to get out of it? You know, they're not going to get anything, and that, that needs to change. That really does. Um, so I'm hoping somewhere, somehow, somebody, somebody pays attention to that and at least does something for their own guys. Well, I'll bring up the fourth thing then. The fourth okay. thing is you want, you're looking for employment to be a protector. Yeah, I am. And so if somebody out there knows of a position that would be perfect for you, your email is in the description. Do you want to say your email? Uh, it's very simple, but I mean, they're not going to be able to spell it unless they look at it in the yeah, description. That's true. Yeah, the last name was, was, it pissed me off pretty bad in kindergarten. It was rough. <laughs> All uh, right. Yeah. And then uh, one last question. Yeah. Do you know where this girl is now? Um, the last I heard, uh, she went through a foster program. Uh, and, and, and one thing I didn't talk about uh, when I told the story, immediately after, uh, after that incident at the police department with the father happened, um, after I got pulled off of him and everything, uh, one of the very first things that happened was we sent officers over to um, the local grade school to take the other two children from that family into protective custody. So there were three kids all together. Um, the other two were older, obviously, they're in grade school. Took them into protective custody. To my knowledge, they all entered the foster program. Um, and then uh, they all ended up with a distant aunt um, that, uh, from what I understood, is, is taking very good care of them. Uh, and the parents don't have, uh, I don't believe they have visitation. As far as I know, I'm very, I'm confident the father doesn't at least. Um, uh, and, uh, I didn't talk about the mother. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to probably keep it that way. That's, that's probably best. All right. Yeah. Well, I think, um, you're a hero in everybody's eyes other than these two federal prosecutors in Kansas city. And, uh, and uh, I hope when we release that 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 you feel that way, and and that uh, and that something good comes of this, and and uh, man, I really hope that I know you're gonna cross paths with that 
little girl at some point in time again. And uh, that'll be that'll be cool to hear about. But yeah, I just want to tell you, Chief, it was a real honor to have you here sitting in that chair and 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 to get your interview. Like I said, it was like I've been trying to get you on here for a long time now, and uh, yeah. we finally got you here. And, and I'm really glad that you were able to to tell your your piece. So thank you for coming. Oh, I, I appreciate the opportunity, absolutely. I, I've looked forward to this for a long, long time and, and hoped it would happen. And, uh, you know, I'm, 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 really, I'm really pleased with, uh, with the way things went. This is a far better experience even than, than I'd hoped for. So I appreciate it very much. Good. Yeah. Best of luck, brother. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers.